Hello there, everybody. So, Butter Night Dragon Hammer, and welcome back to Tokyo Babu. Probably the one thing that won't be falsely copyright claimed. Anyway, in the last episode, Lilith is. Lilith. And we went with the option to choose Lilith, and for some reason, we fused with Samael. Let's just jump right back in. That's basically the shorthand summary. It was most positively a fight to the death. Earth quaked, and waters boiled as Leviathan howled. An unprecedented storm raged through the River of Wailing. Still, there was never a time where Lilith had been exposed to actual danger. Attacks that fell on her didn't work. The others she would stop even before they started, or even worse, reflect them back. Leviathan lay before Lilith's feet. Lilith shook her head with sorrow on her face. あなたがやった行為は正真正銘の時間稼ぎに過ぎない。<笑> Nope. Lilith made a somber face. Leviathan lost his words for a moment. Lilith made a faint smile. That's just sad. Indeed, there was nothing else for her anymore. What a foolish ending. There was nothing waiting for her beyond that dream. Not hope, nor despair. She would continue living in nothingness. Continue to exist. With no demons or angels to revere them, a god was just another beast. Her so-called servants were monsters that lived according to instinct, with no sentience in their minds. Her world had nowhere to move forward, nowhere to expand. The primordial land stuck in an eternal stagnation. Leviathan, Leviathan narrowed his eyes. Leviathan closed his eyes with a smile. He'd be lying if he said he had no regrets. Still, he could not deny there was a sort of satisfying catharsis to his death. The world still had hope. He had sacrificed his life to protect it. And so he was content with his fate. He never yearned for much to begin with. He spent an eternity absent-mindedly swimming through the seas. But he didn't dislike that life. He definitely didn't. Lilith stood up after exactly five minutes as Leviathan let out his last breath. The way she was now, not even space posed an obstacle to her. She could go wherever she wanted, return to wherever she wished. Oh, now we're here. Ugutu Sorumi had no re recollection of being a baby, nor she could recall her parents or friends. The oldest memory she had was sleeping on the school's desk. That was where all and everything had started for her. Maybe. She had a vague but terrible suspicion that her past might not have existed before that point. That she was a very realistic doll made by someone's hands. That someone had discarded her on a whim. That she was a half-hearted, superfluous existence. But who cared? She tried to console herself. 
there was no need to drive herself to an existential corner because the man she loved had feelings for another. She continued to ponder, for there was nothing else she could do. Uriel, the Flame of God, one of the four Master Angels. Succumbing to madness, he apparently became a master to one of the stratums. Yet now, he was dancing from joy, devouring kegs of grape wine. Astroth must have completely messed up his mind. She had to admit demons were indeed the masters of deceit. She wished him to go away, but she didn't expect him to listen. For starters, she evaded the question. She stole a glance at Uriel's face. It didn't seem like he was angered by her words, though she could still spot perplexity in his eyes. He might be slowly catching on to the truth. She took a deep breath. She didn't stand a chance against him in a fight, or rather, the idea itself was ridiculous. She turned to dust the instant he hit her. And so she could do nothing else but wait. All that was available to her right now was buying time until someone appeared to save her. Her main worry right now was what Uriel would do if he realized she wasn't the Holy Mother. In the best case scenario, he'd be deeply disappointed and let her go. In the worst case scenario, he'd kill her. In the average case scenario, he'd keep her as a prisoner. She could pray for the best case scenario all she wished, but Uriel was positively mad right now. She couldn't imagine him just letting her go on a whim. The average case scenario would be hardly different from the current situation. Though unlike now, Uriel would grow a lot more unpredictable. In that case, she also couldn't rule out the possibility of him changing his mind and killing her later. Or rather, that possibility was exceedingly high. And in the worst case scenario, well, she'd have no choice but to lay down and die. At least, he wouldn't harm her as long as he saw her as the Holy Mother. And so she arrived at the most obvious conclusion. She had to keep him thinking that she was the Holy Mother no matter what. Uriel? Uriel gave Stormy a glare, his eyes sharp and imposing his razor blades. You know? Stormy, you could... Use Uriel in his mad state. えっと、ラジエルや構えるは彼らは壊れた。壊れてしまった。無理からぬことです。すがりつくべき神がお隠れになった今、何をしていいのかわからないのでしょう。ウリエルはわかるの?わかりますとも。この僕が神の子を育て
ひとまずはここで休憩を取った後この東京バベルを踏破していただきます何聖母であるあなたならば問題ないでしょうわかりましたともあれ今はしばらく休みましょうはいでは僕はこの周囲を見回っています何か用向きがあればお呼びくださいうん He extended his wings and shot into the sky. Sormi let out a sigh of relief as he disappeared beyond the horizon. He was obsessed with her to the point of madness. All he wanted was to make the world right again. His words stemmed from goodness and goodness alone. Unfortunately, he had long lost his ability to judge a good method or interpret sensible results. He couldn't even recognize the identity of the very holy mother he clung to. Sormi continued to ponder. Perpetually dwelling on all aspects of this world ever since opening her eyes in that orange classroom. Who caused the divine calamity? Who made Tokyo Babylon? Why? What was the destination of them all? Some of her questions had answers, some didn't. Most of them didn't have much to do with her as an individual, but the last one. that one, she had to scrutinize the littlest detail. Where should they. where should she head to in the end? What was the correct choice? The future or the present? The present had already been almost lost. This world was filled to the brim with death. Its stench permeated its, its every layer. Hence, the survivor should go to the future. Sormi thought that decision to be the most sensible. Still, something she couldn't quite pinpoint bothered her. Is it? <laughs> yes, it was Tendao Setsuna. Where was he now? And what happened to Lilith in the end? Question after question, her wish to see the boy again grew stronger and stronger with every passing thought. She wished to see and talk with him again. That was the only thing that still tied her to the present. <sighs> was the situation where she should cling to God? Unfortunately, at this point, she had long lost all faith in the divine. And she wasn't mistaken in that choice, for God was already dead. Without a hint of struggle to survive, it stopped all of its functions for all time to come. And to make matters worse, the new God on the throne. Tiamat Lilith was at present on her way to eradicate all angels, demons, and mankind. Two figures, casting the stubborn whispers of the chorus away, ascended to the steps. Their only goal, heaven. Adam and Eve. Breaking through the seventh stratum, the two were already at the very end of their pilgrimage. Adam betrayed little emotion about the fact, even though it was a dead, worthy, a deed worthy of unadulterated admiration. He considered the solemn gates. Adam and Eve opened the gates together. Adam's next goal was to become a sacrifice to quell God's anger and turn it to joy instead. She couldn't let him do that. Eve had a goal of her own. Having God die was a part of it. The hardest and most complicated of parts. As long as she could get that done, the path to her ultimate goal would cease to be a vague dream. What the? Why does heaven look normal now? Even he was at a loss for words. Heavy was heaven was empty, devoid of everything. Oh! Huh. Only a strange object loomed in the horizon of the barren land. Still in a daze, she gave him a nod and the two started onwards. Did she make a mistake somewhere along the way, or was she too late for something? Oh, what the hell? Her mind a whirl with confusion, Eve stopped before the thing. She comprehended. She ended up comprehending it all. This was the carcass of God. No arms or legs, no eyes, no face. A surreal object pierced, pieced together from thin metallic place that looked like a sculpture from a modern art museum. Carcass? It didn't resemble a living being in any shape or form. 
Not a trace of bones, muscles, skin, or organs ever being a part of it. Of, of the thing. Oh, shit. A girl sat on the carcass, nonchalantly swinging her legs. Something was off. She had the same face, but the air about her was nothing like Eve knew. The color of her hair and eyes, too, seemed to have changed. Her sister was indeed a demon, but she was supposed to be the least demonic of them all. Yet this incarnation of terror before her eyes... Who was it? Her heart jumped. The name the woman used to refer to herself surprised her enough. But the part about her wish pierced Ava like a knife. Eve. Eve like a knife. Sorry, Ava. What the fuck? There was no hostility in Adam's words, nor did he grow tense or show despair on his countenance. He could understand full well that the girl before him was a being of incredible power. Yet he showed not a hint of fear, a bold display, or did he simply not possess the emotion itself? Stop. Adam was the last person she wished to hear it. Eve considered Lilith's outstretched hand and her smile, assuring the girl that the end result wouldn't change whether she took the hand or not. But as she brushed it off, her sister would turn to a foe. And in that case, what chance was there for Adam and herself to prevail? The choice was clear. She took Lilith's hand. There was nothing to regret. The biggest wall standing in between her and her goal had shattered. That was all. What was left now? <laughs> With that, Adam returned his sword back to the pocket dimension. He didn't know anything. He didn't know how terrifying in truth that parlay actually was. Adam, Okay. Hmm. Adam gave her a small, simple nod as if it were the most obvious choice in the world. It was only natural. He was designed to obey everything Eve told him. There was nothing strange about his behavior. He would go on and destroy the world just like this. Adam. Sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. She wished for forgiveness for having robbed him of his mind. This was no love. Their marriage was a sham. Tiamat Lilith let out a jovial laugh and mentioning she had business of her own promptly disappeared. Eve wished to clear the misunderstanding up, tell her that there was no love between them, but after a few moments she realized there was no meaning in such a thing. Adam cocked his head with a troubled expression. Eve thought his manner ridiculous and sad. There was no love between the two. Their hearts were miles apart. Oh. 
and that's why Eve couldn't quite understand what he had done. He embraced her with vigor that seemed to stem from nothing else but unadulterated affection. Adam... She had no idea what he was talking about. So what if she looked sad? Adam's face was millimeters from hurt, and like always a blank look at him. She asked no such thing of him. This wasn't her wish. He didn't. And so this situation was impossible. He couldn't possibly move out of his own volition. She suffered a shock bigger than that when, when she met her sister in this place. The man did this all out of his own will. Adam considered her reaction with puzzlement in his eyes. He then nodded to himself and drew away. An indescribable sense of loss clutched at her heart. Callous questions, confusion, and an emotion she couldn't quite understand blended together, taking her words away from her. Adam showed no hesitation with his answer. Eve's heart erupted in conflict at what he said. Should she order him to do something ridiculous so he could understand his situation for himself? For example, should he make him lick her shoes or, or break his own arms? That would likely be enough to wake him up to reality, but what point was there to it? Still, it might be for the best to have him know his place. <laughs> In the end, only an innocent order can leave her lips. Adam nodded and gave her his hand. Eve gave a bashful smile, an expression she'd crafted and perfected over the years finally appeared on her face naturally. The two joined their hands, and so a barren place that used to be heaven turned into a dancing hall for the original man and his... For a moment, at least. Hmm. At least they still have their moments. Raziel, Secret of God, scoured the area for traces of Uriel. She sniffed the air like a hound for the smallest hint of his smell. She inspected and analyzed all the traces that might have remained on the ground. Kubitsu Sonomi was an incredibly important individual, a key to the world of the future. She kept repeating that to herself. In, the, in that way, she had hoped to push the other fact from her mind, that she was personally acquainted with and loved Sonomi as her friend. The girl's life rested upon Raziel's ability to track her down. That fact would disturb her concentration. She had to calm down and force her and form her plan of action in a cold, meticulous, and logical manner, like making a ship in a bottle. For one, they will probably have to erase Uriel, though for this one deed, she didn't have to rely on herself. To tell the truth, being a scholarly type, she had serious doubts about her ability to win against Uriel in a fight. Camiel, indeed, was a much better choice for matters of that nature. She had to rescue Kuzo Sormi no matter what. The lives of everyone in Tokyo Babel might as well have rested upon her safety. Uriel wouldn't leave Sormi alone the way he was now, and Sormi couldn't possibly escape from him. He currently saw and revered her as the Holy Mother of God, and at the same time he deemed everyone else to be his foes. He was doubtless patrolling the area the two were hiding at like a killer bee protecting its hive, 
The moment she'd get into his territory, he'd likely attack her right away and waste no time on questions. She doubted there was any room for threats or negotiation with that angel. In other words, she'd have to enter the fight on the defensive, making sure the Stormy was safe and then escape with her. Easy peasy. To say at least. She detected them just as she arrived at the aqueduct. She was about to say Roger when their communication link suddenly disconnected. <laughs> Razio glanced around and clicked her tongue. The area around her became shrouded in the impenetrable dark of the night, despite it being in the middle of afternoon. Oh, God. There were very few who could pull off such a feat. The Grand Chancellor of Hell, with concealment as his race on dare, was one of them. <laughs> Lucifuge appeared, floating in the air, and looked down upon Raziel. The angel sighed and read her tablet. <laughs> Razo took an unsteady step back to dodge the almost invisible attack. Instinct or rather precognition. Her head could run virtual simulations. <laughs> Light surrounded Raziel as she uttered the spell, repelling the tentacles of darkness that were about to ensnare her. Yeah, <laughs> The asphalt melted away, and coiling around Lucifuge's feet, suddenly pulled the demon down to the depths of its swamp of car. <laughs> ah, the power of the thrones. A blazing wheel appeared above Lucifuge and dropped straight on him. Raziel, true to her word, crushed the sneak. <laughs> Sharp pain suddenly assaulted Raziel's ankle. A black stream seemed to have cut around her before she knew it. She followed it with her eyes to see it came from the inside of the swamp of tar. <laughs> she booted another spell in an instant, surrounding herself with a thick layer of air, but it wasn't enough to neutralize the stream clutching her. She was hurled into the air and crashed into the asphalt with incredible force. <laughs> <laughs> Her bones creaking, a mouthful of blood vacated her throat. Her insides couldn't escape the damage. The scenery around her blurred, most likely because she crashed into the asphalt head for ugh. <laughs> Lucifuge emerged from the swamp of tar, seemingly unharmed. Raziel pursed her lips at Lucifuge's unscathed form. She felt neither despair nor resignation. She continued to analyze the situation, looking for a way to prevail. But in that moment, a completely unexpected variable suddenly entered the equation. Beside, Lucifuge twisted his face in irritation as he as well saw him emerge. <laughs> Raziel had to agree. The Mad Angel was like lightning. He never knew where he would strike. <laughs> Lucifuge sighed and raised his right hand. A swarm of black strings coiled all around Uriel the next instant. <laughs> Naraba Yosha was in 
このウリエルが神罰を執行する Uriel's strategy, if one were to be generous, was exceedingly simple. He doused the entire area in flames. He raged like a mad beast. And yet Raziel could do nothing but run from his attacks. It was natural to use water against fire, but the thick wall of liquid that covered Raziel evaporated the very instant he came in contact with the roaring flames. <laughs> Damn it. Fuck you, Lucifuge. Lucifuge made a huge jump back. But Uriel ignored him. He stopped his onslaught and considered Raziel with eyes burning with killing him. Not. Uriel covered his face with his hands. Raziel shuddered from a bad premonition. Uriel's howl fell on her like an explosion. Jesus Christ, that face! For a split second, Raziel froze in place, overcome by a torrent of thoughts and emotions. It wasn't like he retained the wits to utilize the situation to his advantage, but Uriel's punishing flame ended up crashing into her right at that moment. <laughs> Without getting the chance to let out a scream, she crashed into the hard ground. Lucy Fuge's trick a couple of moments ago was child's play compared to the potency of this mad attack. She felt herself burn. She felt herself melt. She felt herself turn to ash. <laughs> She couldn't control her breathing. She summoned water to cool and regenerate her skin, but Uriel wasn't the opponent who'd let his victim off the hook like that. He rammed his feet into her stomach. She regurgitated blood. It's likely that he'd just crush some of her organs. He didn't know how she could possibly answer his question. Surprising herself, Raziel considered the raging Uriel with a perfectly cold and collected mind. Indeed, she didn't know why she was still alive. It was a deep question, brushing against the inner layers of her very race on dare. Because she wanted to read? That was a hobby. So she could defeat Uriel? No, she didn't care about such things. Save Kukutsusorumi? That was her wish, of course, but that was not reason enough to live for. But there was something else, beyond the rescue of her friend. Something that... She wished to see the future of mankind. Human lives didn't revolve around pilgrimages to Tokyo Babel. They had much more important goals of their own. To write new books, for example. To come up with ideas that she would have never dreamed of herself. Novels, records, essays. Mortals presented her with boundless knowledge. New possibilities. One thing that mortals possessed and angels didn't. That's why she wished to save them. To save the unknown. To save the future. To save the boundless possibilities. But she fell here. All that would return all that would return to dust. She didn't want that. She grinded her teeth, concentrating her whole energy into her hand, she summoned a spell of earth. A metal projectile as hard as a diamond is as heavy as mercury crashed into Uriel's face. Nani? She stood up somehow. She brushed the blood off her lips and proceeded with the coldest of tones. She heard all over, the flames surrounding Uriel, as if growing sentient, were gnawing at her flesh, cooking her as she were within a grill. But she took the pain, Uriel's anger and hate head on. She didn't care at all. It was a personal sin she had to atone by herself. But she wasn't important right now. This fight right here wasn't related to her past or redemption.
Raziel's words were potent enough to pierce a mad heart. She smiled at her foe's astonishment. Raziel clutched onto her tail. A chant, not one begging for a blessing, but laying a curse. The most depraved way to utilize one of the four basic elements. The rain that fell for 40 days and 40 nights. The flood that prevailed on Earth for 150 days. A flood that only Noah and those chosen by him survived. Even the flames of divine punishment were nothing against this rain, for it was a tool to destroy the world itself. あなたは息子の子供にいるけど、私が作りつけた。海に出るのは分かるだろう。今あなたは決定的に窮地。舐めるな、ラジエル。四大天使であり、前線で戦い続けた僕が、貴様ごときに。私の戦う子供は。ギ
Stormy was hit by an incredible wave of heat as she turned around. The whole dome seemed to suddenly light up in flames. Uriel howled as he lunged towards them. Raziel, losing the color from her face, prepared to meet him. Sormi instantly understood the situation. If Raziel fought Uriel here, she had no chance of winning. If she just went on to the offensive, she might have still held her ground somewhat. But there was no way she'd be able to fight Pop properly and look out for Sormi at the same time. And it would be foolish to expect Uriel to show mercy at this point. Raziel had to do some had to somehow get out of this area while fending off Uriel and protecting Sormi at the same time. There was no way she could pull it off. But what other option did they have? Who could Sormi? What do you think? A stupid question. The choice was clear. Uriel froze in place the moment these words left her lips. She continued to address the bewildered Uriel. あなたはただ単に素顔を落としているだけ何もかもに絶望しているからどうしてそんなことthe air around Uriel was warped and twisted. Realizing that Uri Raziel tried to stop Stormy, but the girl continued with her rejection in a cold tone. The notion didn't shackle, didn't shackle him as hard as one might have expected. It was a thing Astaroth put into his head, after all, not his own genuine conviction. He can continue thinking of Fugutsu Sormi as a holy mother up until this point only because she herself didn't seem to deny it. In other words, Sormi's speech had shattered the last illusion still veiling his mind. Razio shook her head. Sormi understood that much herself. She understood perfectly well. Sormi smiled and glanced up into the sky. The cry towards the heavens did indeed reach the ears of the Crimson Angel. It was a miracle that Uriel managed to jump out of harm's way in time, or it may have been a testament to his incredible sense of that. Retribution's bullet had drilled through the very ground that Uriel had been standing on moments ago. Camille returned Uriel's glare of blood-chilling animosity with cold eyes. Even Raziel didn't notice the Crimson Angel up until he fired his weapon. She let it go casually, as if it were nothing significant. But from this point on, Raziel began to suspect that this girl might very well be more apt for using the all-seeing eyes than Gethel herself. The girl whose destiny was to leave him to the future. Raziel could finally acknowledge her. After all, she was the real thing. Sermi considered Raziel with puzzled eyes. Uriel launched a fireball of the two, but Camille, as if it were the most natural thing ever, promptly shot it down from the sky. Uriel! Camille sighed in mock aggravation. Camille pointed retribution at Uriel. The air itself creaked from the sudden tension. Even Raziel and Sormi, who were on their way to escape, stopped in their tracks. Uriel. 
You reel it out a condescending chortle. Camille agreed with Uriel's words with a serene smile on his lips. Sormi and Raziel considered Camille an astonishment. Nara. A hint of sadness crept on this Camille's countenance. I don't think I'm gonna ever gonna get tired of that voice, honestly. His rage took the shape of flame and shot at Camiel. Easily predicting such an outcome, it was child's play for Camiel to split it apart with a swing of his executioner's sword. Camiel knew how Uriel would interpret his words full well. The Master Angel would never forgive the insolence of someone below. A steel bolt now graced Uriel's hands, the tool that used to seal the very gates of hell. On the other side, Camiel readied his executioner's sword, death, in one hand, and the revolver, retribution, in the other. Hmm. Neither wished to waste their breath any longer. A terrible explosion reverberated across the sky. One would never guess that this was a mere clang of metal, and not the detonation of an atomic bomb. The steel bolt and the executioner's sword clashed. Gritting his teeth, Camiel addressed Raziel without turning to face her. The angel hesitated for a second. Maybe she could help somehow, but she soon changed her mind. She would only get in his way. What about Lucifusion and Astaroth, though? Camiel still had his back to Raziel. Executioner's sword in one hand, revolver in the other, he put his all into holding against Uriel's onslaught. Yet for some reason... Razo could tell he smiled as he told her those words. Timmy. Holy shit, that looks fucking awesome! Ike! Ike, Ike! Itsue! Raziel and Sorami flew into the sky in silence. Uriel wished to pursue them, but even he realized he couldn't turn his back on Cameo. It would take some time to escape from this sword lock that the Crimson Angel got him in. Nara! Ooh! Cameo's left hand jerked back due to the recoil, and the next moment the muzzle of his revolver pointed straight at Uriel's head. Uriel instantly made a steel bolt explode. The blast swept both of them away, but Uriel, prepared for the detonation, was the first to regain his ground. Am even cooler! Forgetting their defense, the two concentrated on destroying each other. One of the bullets hit Uriel right in the forehead. One of the steel nails severed Camille's left arm, sending it flying. Everything around them burned, melted, and fell apart. Unable to withstand their sheer destructive power, the dome that turned into their battlefield soon changed to an unrecognizable ruin. 
Biting down the pain, he reattached his arm. Probably because he favored the connection of nerves first, a burning pain seemed to run along every single cell of his limb. He inhaled a deep breath. He grinded his teeth. His pride made him swallow the pathetic scream that tried to escape his lips. Uriel was the same. He pulled the bullet out of his forehead with his own fingers. Shedding torrents of blood and buying down incredible pain, the two angels glared at each other. Onwards, the nails Uriel's steel bolt had exploded into a shot at Camille. Onwards, Camille initiated a second volley as soon as he reloaded his gun. About most intense and fierce, they didn't even bother to evade each other's weapons. Even though each could rival the potency of a nuclear bomb, the two angels were just brutalizing each other. The steel nails returned back to Uriel's hands, reforming back to his trusty bolt. He smashed it straight into Camille's stomach, the blow akin to that of a giant's fist. The Crimson Angel's adamantine bones shattered like glass. Blood shot from his throat like a fountain. He tried gulping at least part of it back down, the terrible taste of copper filling his mouth. Mother, mother! Spinning around like a whirlwind, he swung his steel bolt again, crushing Camille's back this time. In this case, being slow to fall proved to be a detriment to Cameo. The next moment, another swing of Uriel's steel bolt crashed into his face again. He covered the bloody mess that was with his face with his hands. Still not letting a single scream out, he glared at Uriel through his fingers. Camille spun around, dodging Uriel's next swing. <laughs> the Master Angel couldn't help but click his tongue at his lousy attack. Camille pulled the Peacemaker out of his holster as he spun, and now its silver muzzle aimed straight at Uriel. Six shots. Two in between the eyes, two in the heart, and one in each of his hands. The six bullets drilled holes in the Master Angel's flesh with absolute precision. <laughs> And that wasn't all. The bullets of retribution held the power to shackle sinners to the earth. Their effect, of course, was meager on a master angel, but... He tossed retribution aside and he clutched the hilt of death with both of his hands. Barely two meters separated the two angels. He had to go straight. If he could just maintain this trajectory... <laughs> An almost palpable vision of death popped into Uriel's mind. His opponent's weapon was an executioner's sword that granted absolute death to everyone short of God himself. No being could escape the end after having their neck severed by its blade. Still, the old Uriel, possessing the soul of a master angel, might have still been able to transcend such a fate somehow. Fortunately, rather than staying tied to this world, the souls would inst instead instantly vanish in this post-divine calamity universe. Uriel's was no exception. If you met the blade, he'd die. You'd do nothing about it. Hence, therefore, Uriel regained his old self for a split second. He regained his mind, his ability to reason, design strategies, and look for holes in the technique of his foes. <coughs> With a terrifying howl, he tore away from one of the bullets that shackled him. He literally tore the pieces of his body that the bullets were embedding into shreds. <laughs> Camille's deadly strike fell on Uriel's chest instead. A fountain of blood shot from the wound, and it was far from lethal. And as long as it wasn't deadly, Uriel could heal it like any other wound. He glared at Camille with hateful cold eyes. Jesus. Fierce flames erupted all around Uriel. He bolted to the horizon, retreating from the battle at the speed of a jet. The instincts of a hardened warrior brutally declared the truth. He'd most definitely die if he stayed in this place. Despite his words, Camille understood full well that while his attack in the end didn't prove lethal, it still caused long-standing damage to the angel. For to escape, he had to tear his arms and heart away. Camille steeled his heart for their undoubtedly forthcoming second encounter. He sighed and, supporting his still aching body, flew away. 
He had to catch up with Raziel and Stormy as soon as possible. A telepathic link suddenly opened in his mind. He kept the transmissions off during the battle, but he guessed he had time to hear subordinates out now. His mind went completely blank for a second. There we go. Flames were devouring Pandora, leaving only dust and ash in their wake. Ironically, it was the holy relics of the angels themselves bestowed upon mankind that laid waste their current abode. The spear that had tasted the blood of a saint, and the holy swords that once forged history itself. And it was Adam the most powerful man that the angels themselves created, who wielded the old relics with deadly intent. A shadow of a young man flickered among the flames, the holy sword Durandal with twitched in his hands, and pierced the chest of the angel who tried clinging to his knees, showing no hesitation whatsoever. A girl appeared, nestled at Adam's side. She made a bashful smile. Infernal flames erupted from the tip of Adam's sword, engulfing all the angels around the two and turning them to ash in mere moments. The part of the wall crumbled. The classroom beyond its falling apart in its wake. The classroom beyond it falling apart in its wake. Oh god, anybody but the Dentalians. The two proceeded straight to the library. There was no one left alive in the area who could possibly stop them. The male and female Dentalians stood in the way of the library. They paid no particular attention to Adam or the sword in his left hand. Still, there were only two of them. No other Dentalians seemed to be around. The books in the library were collected from countless worlds of the multiverse. Their number is more or less infinite as far as the human mind is concerned. It was impossible to move them all in a short span of time. The Italian obsessed over books to the point of lunacy. There was doubtless nothing more precious to them in this world, and so Adam expected them to all to try to protect this place no matter the cost. Likewise, one shouldn't hesitate to light his books on fire to save the life of a little girl shivering from the deadly cold. The girl traced her fingers against the cover of the book in her hands, as if she were stroking the hair of a loved one. The words, the passion. 
私たちが全てを滅ぼすわ本はもう二度と書かれることはないエンタリアンメイドアマーキングスマイルイブお前はパンドラを打ち滅ぼし天使も悪魔も人間も滅ぼそうというのだろういいえ天使も悪魔も人間も自分もです She declared her plan to take her own life with a tender smile そうかこれは悪魔としての勘だ話半分として聞け伺いましょうお前の願いは聞き届けられない<笑>アダムイブお前たちを打ち滅ぼす者が間もなく眼前に立つだろうそれは興味深いなアダムパーティーの lips for the first time イブ considered his face surprised only she could understand the true emotion hidden in those words アダム was delighted by the thought 心強い言葉に礼を言う望むなら一瞬で済ませても構わないが本と共に燃やせためらうことなどないいいです行けアダムイブ最後に残された場所へ向かえ<笑>アダム nodded and swung his sword severing the very space of the library ah damn it どうした I like the Dentalians. Sakihodo no Kotobaga, Kinika Katemaste. What? Tendo Setsnadaro. Adam said the name as if it were the most obvious thing in the world. Eve strained her back out of surprise. Do ste Karedato. Kan? Yeah, Chigana. Saiboda. Ore no Saiboga Sasayaiti. Omae no Shukutekina. もうすぐここにやってくると。Neither Setsuna nor Adam knew the truth. That Adam was made according to Setsuna's design. The only parts different between them were their faces and their hearts. Everything else was exactly the same, be it their muscular build, sturdiness, or speed. But their engines, their hearts, differed greatly, and Adam, whose heart was designed especially for battle, had the upper hand in this case. Still, this world was ruled by the power of Raison Dare, not that of the physical. If Tendas hasn't has found a reason to live in his journey, then. Anzerna. Makewashinai. Orewa. Aizdakiniwa Makenai. So. Noticing a shadow on Eve's face, he made such a declaration. So, this name. She smiled. Adam turned his gaze to the sky, and Eve, too, on some metaphysical level, understood. She understood that he would definitely come. And soon, Adam and Eve proceeded towards the roof, together. The last bastion of Pandora, the fall of which would signify its end. The two had not a drop of hesitation left in their hearts. <laughs> Uh, I thought it would be instant. No, don't do this. The flames engulfed the walls of the library. The Dentalians sat on their wooden chairs and regarded the burning library absent minded, disappearing. Ash. It was the fate of everything in this world to turn to dust in the end. The passion, the knowledge, the memories, the records. Everything. The young man let out a sigh. Oh. Damn it, don't start crying. A tear trickled down the girl's cheek. She probably didn't realize it due to the heat evaporating it. There was no telling how much effort went into creating everything there was in this place. Some books took months, some years, some decades to write. A thought crossed the mind of the young man as he regarded the crying girl. 
気づいているかダンタリン我々はここまで本を揃え感知守ってきたにもかかわらずああそうだな我々は本を書いたことがない The young man's next words came out naturally, almost as if insignificant. The girl nodded to the young man. So, Kai can you? The girl and the young man turned to their blank pages with smiles most unbefitting the perilous situation. Nani o Kakoka? So, said that. The young man nodded and considered the blank page with a pen in hand. After a few dozen seconds, the two regarded each other again. Refusing to give up, the two nonetheless began penning their stories. No one would ever see, would ever read their writing. They continued pouring their souls into the paper. They wrote. They wrote because they wanted to. They tried writing what they thought. They tried applying the techniques they knew. They tried writing from their hearts. Both got momentarily surprised by each other's face. For both wore childish grins on their lips. The young man tried his hand at a fantasy adventure story. He wasn't foolish enough to make himself the protagonist. There are many others more fit for fighting dragons than he. The girl tried her hand at a romantic story. She regretted making herself the protagonist right away. The whole thing was too embarrassing to write. Words poured onto the page, painting a heroic saga for the perseverant hero, enduring peril after peril. Words poured onto the page, painting a happy end of love in the face of many an adversary. <laughs> They exchanged their minute stories that fit but a single page. They read through them in seconds, almost in an instant. <laughs> the girl smiled. <laughs> the young man smiled. For、well, the last words of both of their stories turned out to be the same.、Uh... Tiny gesture of gratitude to each other, selves they thought to leave behind. The flames continued to devour the library, not letting a single piece of paper escape. Yet, and nonetheless, the two Tintalians who chose to remain in the library to the very end, minding not the deadly heat of the flames, lost themselves in the joy of reading for one last time. Okay, that's where I'm gonna end it because my heart cannot not take. Oh. God damn it. Oh, my heart cannot take that. Oh. oh, damn it. The characters I hardly ever get to see turned out to. Oh, God.、Oh. So now, favorite characters, Raziel and the Dentalians. Damn it. I'm <sighs> gonna freaking tear my heart up. Ah! God! Ah! <sighs> I'm gonna go just watch a fucking. Just watch a bunch of friggin' cute puppies, cause that just tore me up. And thank you guys so much for watching. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna go down a tub of ice cream and I'll see you guys in the next video.